Okay, so let, let me take two minutes of your time before we start the second lecture. Um, I'm going to try to organize a hike on Sunday morning, okay? And the idea will be that we leave the, uh, the area over by Kittredge around 830 and uh, go up uh, Green Mountain. Uh, when you go outside and look at the skyline, there's a little mountain, a medium-sized mountain, and two big mountains that look like one mountain all behind us. And I want to go up the medium-sized one. That's called Green Mountain. And what I would like to do, if we have enough cars, okay, then what I would like to do is to carpool down to NPAR, which is about three miles south of here and several hundred feet higher, and then basically go over the mountain from behind and then come down. And the nice thing about that is those of you that don't have cars can simply walk down Baseline Road back to the dorm, okay? Uh, the act, you know, the trailheads up baseline are about a mile up baseline. A mile is nothing, okay? And um, so to do this, uh, we will have to have a sign-up sheet to see how many people are there. And if you have a car, uh, please sign up that you have a car so that we can plan, okay? And uh, to do this, you will need two liters of water minimum because it's going to be very hot, okay? and then be prepared for a thunderstorm and good quality shoes and all this kind of nice outdoorsy thing. Uh, and if we don't get enough cars, what we will do, this sounds crazy, but it, it, I, I'm feeling nostalgic for graduate school, okay, is we will simply start at the dorm and go up Green Mountain from the dorm, okay? And there's about a mile of walking up Baseline Road before you hit trail, okay? And before you complain, I have climbed Green Mountain from my house, and I live about a mile and a half east of here, okay? <laughs> So it's entirely pleasant, and you will see many ecozones doing that, including older urban ecozones. Okay, fine. <laughs> but so if you have a so if you have a car or have friends who have a car, uh, persuade them to put their name on the list, and the list and all this stuff will appear uh, where Professor Schwartz is leaning uh, when he begins to talk. And um, so sign up by tomorrow afternoon. I'd like to have a head count. We're not going to tick you off as you go up. Okay. But I'd like to know, are there 20 people, 30 people, 40 people? How many cars are there? And then we'll, then we'll do it, okay? Um, I could do this trip if I was moving very fast in four or five hours. But I am, much, I am slower than you. And what else do you have to do on Sunday afternoon besides sleep in, right? I mean, you know, uh, well, you know... Uh, you're at Cassie. <laughs> yeah. This is Welcome back. So we're progressing through the particles in the standard model, talking about how they show up at the collider, and we're going to, um, we've slowly been working down in mass. Um, and we talked about the top quark last time. Uh, are there any further questions about the top quark? All right, well, keep, keep them in mind, and you can ask them at any time. Uh, the next particle is to talk about is the bottom quark. Uh, mass of the bottom quark, you remember? Four. So it's around four and a half um, GeV. Uh, the bottom quark, unlike the top, forms hadrons before it decays. Uh, typical hadrons are the B mesons. So that's a 
a BU bar bound state called, uh, that's the B minus, and the B D bar, neutral B, um, also B S bar, which is B sub S. Um, the typical lifetime of these mesons is around uh, 1.6 picoseconds, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. Uh, this lifetime translates into a typical distance. So most things are produced and they're moving at the speed of light. So you typically calculate uh, the decay length which is around uh, 450 to 500 microns. So this is about half a millimeter. Uh, so basically, these B mesons form at the interaction. Remember, everything is forming at femtometer scales. Uh, and then they start moving half a millimeter, and then they decay. Uh, this is typical of uh, B mesons. And this, this decay length is part of the design of the inner detector on Atlas and CMS and LHCB, because they want to be able to see this in order to identify uh, a B meson. Um, so, how does a B decay? Well, it depends a little bit on these, uh, on what the Bs are. So, um, I should say these are the mesons. There's also some baryons like lambda sub B. Uh, some of them have slightly longer lifetimes. It, 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 it's slightly varied, but but this is the majority of the Bs that are produced. Um, so let's take B sub zero. Uh, this typically decays to a D meson, like the. Uh, so it's funny language, but the D mesons are things with charm quarks in them, um, not down quarks. And I think people get confused about that, but we'll talk about charm next. But anyway, D meson. So this is this is at the um, at the uh, quark level. This is a B decaying to a charm and a W, and the W goes to uh, a muon and neutrino, and the B meson is this B tied up with a, uh, a U bar, right? So the U bar just kind of goes along with the ride. And so this B, B sub zero, decays to uh, a D plus here from this decay. Uh, so that's a typical decay of a, a B zero. And then this thing, this charmed meson, is also unstable. So it decays uh, to say a K on. So Ks are strange mesons. Anything with a, with a strange quark in it is called a kaon. Um, so this would decay to, say, k minus uh, pi plus pi minus. Um, and then the kaon might decay to another pion. Um, so this is an example of, uh, uh, say, this is pi, pi plus pi zero. Um, so in the end, what you see from a B decay is you see a muon. Uh, you see two charged pions and then another charged pion here. So you see four charged particles and then a neutral pion. And this neutral pion will then decay to photons. Um, so this is typical of B decays. You get a large number of charged particles because of these cascade decays. Because the B goes to charm and the charm goes to strange. The strange goes to up and down. Uh, and then those decay. Um, so a typical characteristic of a B decay so they have, um, uh, let me say, decay lengths of order half a millimeter, um, large multiplicity, meaning you know four to five charge tracks. Um, so these are things you would use to identify that there was a B in the event. Uh, um, so how does this work in practice? Well, I showed this, I showed this uh, diagram before from LHCB. Uh, and the main thing you use for, to find these Bs, so this is, uh, um, right, so this decay length leads to what's called the displaced vertex. And the displaced vertex is this what, what's shown as uh, so. So here, what's going on is this is a primary vertex. This is an LHCb 
I think it's just a reconstruction and they've, they've removed a lot of stuff from the display, but really what happens is the protons collide and you get a lot of tracks coming out of the primary vertex. Um, and then what you see is that some of these tracks, for example, this muon, uh, points back to this B. So this muon is the muon over here that came from uh, the decay of the B. Right? So that's that muon that you'll see if you follow its track, it points back not to the primary vertex, but to some other point. Um, and then what happened here is the B decayed to a D, and then moved off to here, and then that D decayed. Um, this is called the tertiary vertex, and that decayed here, it decays to uh, a pi and two kaons, um, and then those subsequently decay, although you can often see the kaons uh, in the detector. Um, so what they do to identify a B is they look for this uh, displaced vertex, uh, and the way they do that is they try to reconstruct how many tracks point back to this, and of course, it's not always so easy, uh, here you might have one line, the muon, and then you might have a D, and if you have, you know, two or three tracks, you can pinpoint them. Sometimes this might be neutral, uh, and then you would only get one track pointing back to the uh, secondary vertex. And if you only have one track, obviously you can't figure out where the vertex is. So what you use in that case is the impact parameter, which is the, so I have this one track, and I know where the primary vertex is because there's lots of things coming out of it. So I look at the closest distance between this line and the primary vertex. Um, and that, that, uh, and that is a characteristic of a B decay. So you might say you could just calculate all the tracks and measure all of their impact parameters. Uh, so let me just define the impact parameter. So we have, uh, this is the primary vertex with lots of lines coming out, right? And then I might have over here another charged track going off this way. Um, and so I'll, for each charged track, I can calculate this distance of closest approach D. Uh, and that's called the impact parameter. Uh, air conditioning. Um, so you look at the various impact parameters for the various particles that you see. Um, you look for things like uh, the multiplicity, the number of charged particles you get that don't point back to the primary vertex. Uh, you can also do things like construct the invariant mass of all the particles that don't point back to the primary vertex and see if it's close to a, you know, 5 GeV or something typical of a B meson. Um, and all those things are put in together to, to perform B tagging. Um, this is often done, the, the most efficient B taggers use neural networks to combine lots of different information from the tracks, not just the tracks, but the electromagnetic deposits and the information about um, various short distance physics and lots of different B decay modes. Um, and they do it uh, in a, in a I don't know, sort of automated way. Um, what I want to say. So roughly, so all of this gets to B tagging. Uh, typical numbers are you might get 60% uh, Bs identified and uh, one over, I don't know, 30 or so uh, light quarks uh, I want to say rejected. So you can tune this. You can say, I want to have looser B tagging, make not such strong requirements on what the impact parameter can be and so on, and accept you know, 80% of the Bs, but then you'll uh, reject fewer light quarks. Um, some of these can go up to, I saw some recent numbers, they've been you know, continuously improving this uh, to 70% Bs and a 1 over 50 rejection. Uh, so this is clearly better than that because you're keeping more Bs and rejecting more uh, light quarks. Those are typical numbers that you might expect for B tagging. Uh, so, you know, that's pretty good, but if you're trying to find four Bs in the event, you have to take this to the fourth power, um, and it can be bad. So often, if you have more than one B, you'll misidentify one of them, um, and that's not uncommon. Yeah? Does the 150 include charm quarks? Uh, so charm, well, yeah. So so this, this is compared to light quark jets, so up and down jets. It turns out jets formed by gluons are more like Bs. Um, because they tend to have more multiplicity. So one thing that distinguishes B jets is this large multiplicity compared to light quark jets, which just might be a pion or two, um, you know, especially at low energy. Uh, and charm quark jets, we'll talk about those in a minute, but they tend to look like Bs, and it's much harder to tell them apart. Uh, um. And another plot. Here's another LHCB uh, vertex analysis. So again, here... You know, it, it, if you try to imagine this without all the lines drawn, I mean, it's just a bunch of tracks. And here's the, the and this is a projection onto two dimensions. They really have three-dimensional information. Uh, here's the primary vertex, and then there's this B decaying. And you can see here there's a number of tracks reconstructed. Here's a J psi, which is a charm 
bound state, which is something that's uh, very important for calibration and understanding, and, and you see ones produced here. So here they can actually reconstruct the secondary vertex completely. Um. What? How do you see it? What? I mean, it decays. Yeah, this is yeah. This isn't the actual image of the event. This is a reconstruction of it. So they know what the the, the electrodes from the muons from the side decay. Um, okay. Uh, what else do I want to say about bees? So uh, there's actually uh, very nice theoretical methods for studying uh, bee mesons. So there's a nice picture you should know about, which is that the bee a bee meson. You know, remember the bee quark is four and a half GeV. And something like a, a B sub U is surrounded by a light quark, which is essentially massless, right? There's another system which is a bound state of something very heavy and something you know with a mass two thousand times lighter, which is the hydrogen atom, right? And it turns out you can you can understand the structure of B mesons using a very simple analogy to the hydrogen atom, where you have a B in the middle, um, so this would be a B plus, and around it you have say an up quark or U bar, um, which is charge just surrounding the B. Um, and to the extent, so what, what you do is you treat in the same way we treat the proton as essentially infinitely massive. When we solve the Schrodinger equation, you can treat the B as infinitely massive and solve for the eigenstates of this, the energies and so on, and the angular momentum states of this B atom. Right? It's, not, it's like a hydrogen atom, but you still have angular momentum excitations. Uh, and you can study the relationship from the mass difference between the B and the first, you know, J equals 1 uh, excitation of the B, and you can study those in analogy with the hydrogen atom using the strong force rather than uh, the electromagnetic force. Um, so this is this is known this limit. So we take the mb to infinity limit and expand in powers of lambda QCD over mb. Um, and this expansion is known as uh, heavy quark effective theory. It's a very powerful theory that, that predicts a lot of things. Um, there's some kind of sort of elementary calculations you can do and compare directly to data. Um, in particular, you, you can compare the spectra of B mesons and compare them to the spectra of charm mesons, the D mesons. Um, and for example, ratios, so the, the difference in mass between the j equals 1 and the j equals 0 B meson over the relative mass splitting between the uh, charm. In the limit that the mass is infinity, they should be exactly the same because they can't depend on the mass and the mass to infinity limit. And this actually agrees with data pretty well. And for over, you can calculate the first leading order correction, which will be a ratio of m bottom over m charm. Um, and that tends to agree with data pretty well. And you can study lots of spectroscopy of these things. Um, um, you can also calculate these decay rates from uh, uh, in perturbation theory, the leading order thing is just the calculation of the decay of the B quark. But of course, there also is this hadronic matrix element. And they often use methods on the lattice to compute those, although it's very hard to include these heavy quarks directly on the lattice. So they use some combination of lattice calculations, you know, universality relations by separating off these hadronic form factors and uh, scaling relations to extract these, these matrix elements. Um, so maybe someone will talk about that later in TASI. Um, about all I want to say. Oh, I should also say there's uh, this lepton. So, so you get a lepton about 10% of the time. So in a B decay, you get 10% of the time, you get uh, a lepton, which is a mu or an E, mostly, mostly muons. Um, and then you also get, from the Ds, you get a lepton another 10% of the lepton, which is, again, a mu or D. Uh, so roughly 20% of the time for B decay, you get a soft lepton, which is another good way to identify a B. Um, of course, only 20% of the time you get it, but when you do, it's a pretty clear indication that you had a B. Um, so I should add that to the list of things. Soft lepton. So that's included in the B tagging methods. Yeah? That can decay to muons, right? But you want the muon to you want the uh, right. Well, so you can look in the particle data book and see what things have lifetimes have decay lengths around a millimeter, and it's really oh right. You can't just use a soft lepton. 
that's not a very good beating by itself, but you fold it into the neural network and, and you put it into your B tagger. Um, I mean, you can also ask for Bs that you really know it's a B, and having a small lepton makes it a cleaner measurement. Right? And generally, the more charged particles you have, uh, and the more leptons you have, the cleaner it is, because they're easier to measure their momentum. Um, I should say, a lot of the B physics, like heavy quark effective theory, was developed to study the physics of the B factories. Um, and most of you are too young to know when these were around, but they're, you know, Barr and, Bar and Bell were basically, they, they would collide E plus E minus collisions at the, uh, at BB bar resonances, in particular at the mass of the uh, epsilon 4s, which is around, oh, I forget what the mass is, um, 10.6 GeV. So these epsilons are, uh, this is not an epsilon, this is a psi. Epsilon is a, is an epsilon look like something. Uh, so this is a, a, a B, B bound state. This thing goes to uh, BB bar directly. So there's something that if you produce this on resonance, you always produce this thing, and then it always decays to Bs, so you get uh, you know, as many Bs as you want, and you can study their properties in great detail. Uh, anyway, so we learned a lot about Bs, and, and B physics is still an exciting area, particularly at LHCB, for looking for rare decays, which are sensitive to uh, you know, flavor changing neutral currents and existence of supersymmetric particles, and you have sensitivity to energy scales, you know, up to 100 GeV or so from decays that are forbidden in the standard model but might exist from some new physics model. Okay, okay that's enough about B. Let's talk about charm. So I don't have too much to say about charm. Uh, anyone know the charm quark mass? One, one in change. Yeah, around 1.2 GeV. Um, so like the, like the bottom, we have the D mesons. D plus, which is C D bar. Uh, D zero, C U bar. D sub S, which is C S bar. And these are all roughly 1 to 2 GeV. Um, they also decay weakly. Uh, they decay faster. Uh, partly it's due to the mass, but partly it's because the B, when the B decays, it's it's not a diagonal CKM element because uh, it goes B to S, uh, B to C, uh, which has the you know VCB suppression uh, compared to this, which can go uh, charm to strange directly. Um, but in any case, the lifetime of these is around uh, 300 microns. So this is. You know, you'd say, well, this is fairly close to 500 microns, but that factor of two is actually a big difference um, because if it's decaying. So remember, these aren't. This is the average uh, um, decay length, but in practice, there's a distribution, and so many charms you don't you don't see. Um, so this is a little bit. So charm. So you, so you might try to do charm tagging like you do B tagging, use similar features, but unfortunately, because this is uh, you know smaller than CT for B. Um, you also, because you don't have this initial decay, you just get the decay of the D, um, you have lower multiplicity. And you have no soft lepton. Or really, you know, 10% of the time rather than 20%, um, you have a soft lepton. So basically, everything you use for B tagging you can do with charm, but it's all worse. Um, you have fewer charged particles, you have fewer soft leptons, um, you have a shorter displaced vertex. So it's something that's a work in progress, and recent results at LHC seem like they might be able to do it. LHCB can do charm tagging OK. Um, but uh, uh, you know, it's also very hard to tell charms from bottoms, because bottoms decay to charms. So it's hard to distinguish those. Uh, but uh, you know kind of work in progress. It's also because the charm is not as heavy as the B, this heavy quark effective theory model of the analog hydrogen atom doesn't work as well. Um, there's larger power corrections. That is, this thing is, uh, this thing is larger because M, M charm is closer to lambda QCD. So nothing quite works as well with M charm as it does with the bottom. Still, you can do it um, to some extent. OK? That's really all I wanted to say about charm. Uh, let's talk about strange. 
the strange quark, so the strange quark is a light quark, which is around 100 uh, MeV. So it's light. It's not as light as the U and D, but it's still light. Um, the strange mesons are the kaons. Again, we have K plus, uh, well, K zero, and uh, K minus. So K minus is S U bar, K zero is S D bar, and K plus is S U, uh, S bar U. Um, these all have a mass of around 493 MeV. Uh, So they're called strange, as you must know, because they only decay through uh, the weak interactions, through, s well, through, s no. uh, I mean, the, the, they're strange because they have this quantum number associated with the strange quark, but when they decay, they no longer have this strange quark. So they decay very differently from, say, pions, uh, which can, you know, decay strongly. Um, and so, uh, well, I don't know. They were strange when they were first discovered. They're maybe not so strange anymore. Uh, how do they decay? Well, uh, basically, these K zeros decay to. Uh, let me write it down here. Um, so there's there's K zero and K zero bar, the neutral K odd system. Uh, these have the same quantum numbers um, up to strangeness. They have the same QCD quantum numbers. So they can actually mix um, and you have, uh, but they have different, uh, the, the action of charge uh, of CP acts differently on the two states. Um, so what we tend to do is construct the CP even and CP odd eigenstates. So these things can both, I don't want to say, um, so the CP eigenstates are the K short, which is K0 plus K0 bar over root 2, and uh, K long, which is K0 minus K0 bar over root 2. Um, technically, these are called K1 and K2, because there can be, there's some CP violation in the, uh, um, in the weak decays. But basically, this one decays to pi plus, pi minus. This is CP even. And this one is CP odd, um, which decays to three pions. Uh, this one has, this decay time is 0 0.09 nanoseconds. And this one is 52 nanoseconds. So you see there's a big, there's three orders of magnitude difference in the lifetimes of the CP odd and CP even. Uh, so K long lives a long time compared to K short. Right? Uh, so this is uh, 0.09 nanoseconds is 90 picoseconds, uh, which you can compare to the B lifetime of 1.6 picoseconds. So either way, even the K short lasts a lot longer than the B mesons. Right? Um, so that lasts at half a millimeter. This is a factor of 90 bigger, so it goes a meter or so, um, or longer before it decays. Um, so the K shorts often decay somewhere in the detector. The K longs usually uh, get absorbed before they decay. Um, so they're considered stable particles. Both of these are often considered stable particles uh, from point of view of the detector. Um, I, want to say, I guess I don't want to talk too much about CP violation, unless people are interested. Uh, CP violation is basically that the this one can sometimes decay to two pions, and this one can sometimes decay to three pions, which is a CP violating decay, and the observation of that measures this parameter epsilon, uh, or epsilon prime. Uh, right. Uh, what do I want to say? So this is the, well, here's some numbers. So this is the lifetime, yeah. So the, so, uh, Where's my can? So these things have have a uh, C tau of one meter, and these charged ones have around a meter. The 
kaons have something between a centimeter and a meter. So the k short made to k after a centimeter, um, somewhere between a centimeter and a meter, and the k long can go a meter or farther. Uh, right, OK, kaons. Any other questions about kaons? So you can't actually do any kind of strange tagging. There's nothing any particular. I mean, you might try to reconstruct kaons, but if you have a jet and you want to know there's a strange quark in it, well, first of all, there's usually a few strange quarks in the jet because you get kaons from the fragmentation of heavier things and from gluons and so on. So the strange quarks you see are not, because the strange quark is so light, there's very little barrier to producing SS bar states. Um, so it's not really a good quantum number. Right, so a B jet, if you produce Bs, say, from a Higgs decay, there's, there's very little chance that you'll produce extra Bs from the parton shower or what else. But with the strains, that's not true. So you produce a lot of strains. So it's very hard to actually measure branching ratios to strange from measuring the strange content of the jet, which we can't do anyway. What, what would it be used for? Well, I don't know. If you have some supersymmetry model that predicts the, the strange quark, the, I don't know, the scalar strange quark has some property, and you want to know that it was the strange rather than the charm, you know, the, you, you might look for it. but. I, it hasn't come on the horizon yet. Uh, yeah? Um, yeah, I mean, you can. it's not that you can't identify kaons. It's that you don't really need to. Right? So, so CMS does actually a pretty good job distinguishing kaons from, say, protons, um, from not the energy deposition, but also they're in the decays, because um, they are kind of metastable. Uh, so to some extent, that can be seen, and their, their heavier mass you know, shows up differently. but. You know, it's not it's not particularly interesting. Most analysis you can call a kaon, a proton, or a pion, and you know it's all about the same. Uh, right. Okay. And then finally, let's talk about up and down. I'm gonna do it here. The UD quarks are, are light. You know, few MeV. Um, so there's really no barrier at all to pair producing. Uh, up and down quarks from, say, gluon splitting to up and down will immediately produce lots of these things. They bound into pions. So the pions are pi plus and minus, which are you know, u d bar or d u bar, and the pi zero, uh, which is u u bar plus d d bar. Uh, the lifetime, is, uh, lifetime of these guys is around 10 nanoseconds. Um, the lifetime of this is 10 to the minus 17 seconds. Uh, so this decays, the, the pi naught decays to two photons, and you might, you know, this is the, the triangle diagram. So it's an anomaly, so it's actually a strong decay, uh, which is why it's so fast compared to the pi plus, which decays through a weak decay. So you would have a u d bar through a w to, to you know, muon and then a neutrino. Uh, I should say these are around 130 MeV. The, the, the pions. Um, okay. So this thing is a, essentially a prompt decay, that there's no way to tell apart a pion from, I mean, it's not that there's no way, it's that you never see a pion, a neutral pion, really just decays to two photons instantaneously. Um, while a pi plus will move off into the detector at 10 nanoseconds, that's basically stable um, from the point of view of the detector, so it just shows up as a charged track and deposits its energy um, mostly in the electromagnetic and the hadronic calorimeter. Um, Okay, so uh, what I wanted to do next is just give you a sense of uh, how many of these particles. Well, we're going to talk about leptons, but before doing that, just want to uh, give you a sense. Of, here's where we pile up. Where were we? We went through this. Let's get back. Did this thing? Do, do, do. Oh, this one. That's what I want to talk about. So, so actually, let me. I can just show you. So I don't know how many of you have run Pythia or some kind of simulator. Okay, that's good. So that's maybe half, or at least half of you raising your hand. So when you run Pythia, you get something like that. This is a typical output from of an event in the LHC event format. Um, and it's good even if you've never run Pythia. So a lot of people run Pythia and don't even look at the file that they're getting. So I just want to take a minute to talk about what an actual event is. So I don't have data, but I have Pythia, so it's a rough simulation of a data. So let me just kind of take a minute to, to, to discuss um, what we see here. So uh, where's the pointer? Oh, okay, so what is this event record? So when you run Pythia and you get output, so what does this tell you? Actually, 
uh, so first of all, the, the, the top four lines here are the initial states. So these are gluons. I'll explain that in a second. And then you get all these stable particles. Right? So this, so this is just one file for one event. Just gives you a sense of what's involved in a typical event um, at a 13 TV collision. Um, so let me go back to PowerPoint. Uh, so, so what these are, so there's this code, which is a universal code used in high-energy physics, which gives a number to every particle uh, in the standard model, not only the, the quarks, but also the uh, stable or metastable particles. Uh, so the first uh, line of this table tells you what the particle is. So these 20 ones, you look it up in the table, you see it's a gluon. So in this minus one means it's uh, initial state. So this says this was glue glue in the initial state, and it produced glue glue in the final state. Um, the, the two means it's final state, but unstable. Uh, and these ones mean they're stable, stable from the point of view of the detector. So you tell it what you mean to be stable. I'm going to give it a little number here. And so these uh, 111, what's 111? 111 is a pi naught. Uh, 211, 211 is a pi plus. So we see a lot of pi pluses and pi naughts. And then over here we get uh, 2112. So over here is a neutron. Uh, so we get a neutron here, 321. What's that? Uh, the K plus. So, but mostly we're getting pions, these uh, 111s and 211s. You get a couple of kaons, and occasionally you get a baryon, like a proton. Uh, these, in case you're interested, so these ones mean it's stable. I mean, you're just defining what's stable. So you could, really, the pi naughts are not stable, but Pythia lets you decay them afterwards. Um, that is, they're color neutral, so that's really what it cares about. Um, the, uh, these codes are actually the mother particles, so I kind of cut out the middle of the event record, but it has a whole parton shower, and then it talks about the hydronization, and it tells you how you can reconstruct what Pythia actually did, and these tell you the mother particles. So, for example, this tells you these two came from these two. One and two are these two particles, and so both of the final state gluons. Um, uh, so, so, just to give you a sense, so this is, where's my eraser? Uh, so let me just tell you what's in this file. So here's the kind of particles we have. Neutrons and protons, kaons, uh, k-long, pi zero, and pi plus or minus. Um, and let me just tell you how many of these we get. Here there are 25 neutrons, 11 protons, 18 charged kaons, Four neutral kaons, 124 pions, which go to photons, and 387 pi pluses. Right. So basically, everything you get is a pion. Right. And so this is just how you should think about a typical event. You know, you're getting uh, 500 pions and a smattering of other things. Right. People sometimes say pions are like mosquitoes at these machines. They're just everywhere. Right? So all of these vertices, you know, when you talk about all the vertices and secondary vertices, everything is just pions scattering off, and a typical collision, a typical hard interaction might produce 500 or 1,000 uh, charged particles or neutral particles, you know, things that come out. Right? So just a good, 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 good idea to get a sense of actually what's involved in an event and, and the typical multiplicities. Um. Uh, the other thing I want to point out in this event record are which is occasionally useful are these numbers 501, 502, 503, or 504. Those are the color connections. So when Pythia runs or Herwig or any of these event generators, they keep track of the color, and that's important for the hadronization step. These, uh, these numbers, basically, they're colored dipoles. So you'll always have two particles with the same number. So this 501 connects this incoming gluon to that outgoing gluon. 502 came to 2 to 4 and so on. Maybe I have to draw a picture. So we would have incoming gluons like that, and then outgoing gluons. And it all, all these simulations work in the large end limit where they treat color like a dipole. So they basically treat um, n squared minus 1 and n squared the same. So instead of the uh, adjoint representation being of uh, n squared minus 1 dimensional traceless matrix, it's just n squared. So just take any entry in that n squared matrix. Um, and so let me get a colored chalk. Right, so if we say this is 1 and 2, 3 and 4, 
Uh, and if we look at that code, so 501 connects the first one to the third one. So this would be 501 as a color string like that. Um, and then 502 connects 2 to 4. So that would look like that, maybe. And then uh, 503 connects 2 to 3. I'll draw it in a different color. I don't have any more colors. So this is 503, and then 504 is going to be the remaining one. So basically, it treats this colored dipole as coming in, and then it takes half of the dipole and sends it off with the glue on, and uh, half of this dipole. Um, so this would be you know, a red-blue glue on, and then this becomes a red-green glue on, or whatever it is. Um, and if you had quarks, if the glue on, say, branched into quarks, then you would have the color of the quark would pick up one of the colors from the dipole, and the other quark would have the other color. Um, so if you're interested in studying color at colliders, it's important to know what that event record is and kind of get a sense of how it works. Um, and uh, well, well, anyway, those are the basic ingredients. An event record, uh, you can decide to what level you want to dissect it when you're doing your own analysis. Yeah? Could you repeat that n squared versus n squared minus 1 comment? That I don't think I really it. Right, so if you have, QCD has three colors, right? So if I'm treating every gluon as having uh, one color over here and an anti-color over there, that's three over here, three over there is nine. Right? And really it's eight gluons. So I'm treating n squared and n squared minus one, which is eight, as the same. So in the limit that n is large, n squared and n squared minus one approach each other. But for three, it's eight and nine, so it's off by 10%. Um, and usually things come in as n squared. So it's really, well, I don't know. I think 10% is a rough idea of the estimate of how good this dipole approximation is. Um, but if you didn't do this, you'd have to keep track of the whole color representation. And it's not even this semi-classical picture of things branching, and you can't really describe it that way. You'd have traces and different products of traces. But in the larger limit, everything simplifies, and this dipole picture describes everything. Moreover, all the scattering diagrams are planar. It makes it a lot simpler to actually do the simulations. None of the simulations would actually work if we didn't make this approximation. Of course, there's effort in the QCD community to go beyond the large-end approximation. Um, uh, but I think it's very hard to continue the parton shower beyond that. So you do a kind of a fixed order calculation at finite n, and then take the n to infinity limit to, to run the shower. Um, but maybe there's still, there might be progress in that in coming years. Other questions? Um, OK, let's talk about leptons. Uh, so leptons, there's the electron. Maybe I'll do it on this backboard here. Um, I don't know. Not, too much to say of the electron. So electron, basically electron is a you know energetic charged particle. It's stable. Um, it radiates a lot. Radiates a lot. Um, well, a muon radiates um, radiates less. So it's heavier, so it doesn't radiate as much. Um, simple classical physics tells you. Um, so it basically interacts weakly. The, the muon is unstable, but its lifetime is 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Um, which gives C tau is around 100 meters. Um, and of course, the faster the muon is going, the longer its lifetime, because you have time dilation. Uh, you know, this is a typical scale of a detector. So generally, muons get out of the detector before they decay. Uh, um, so they deposit a little bit of energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter, uh, but mostly they move on into the muon calorimeter, and then they get out of it. So you have to measure the energy by seeing the curvature of the muon, and measuring this curvature tells you the, the uh, momentum, the energy over the mass of the muon. You can determine the energy from that. Uh, OK, but the interesting one is the tauon. Uh, maybe I'll talk about him over here. So let's talk about taus. So taus are funny because they're leptons, but they act a little bit like hadrons. Um, they act more like, you know, almost like charm mesons rather than leptons. Uh, so tau has a mass of uh, 1.7 GeV. Um, typically, a tau decays weakly to a W. 
But then the W, we talked about the W before, it decays mostly hadronically. Uh, so sometimes you'll get a W going to a muon and a neutrino. Uh, this happens 30% uh, of the time. When this happens, basically the tau looks just like a muon. And you get some missing energy, but mostly you get the muons associated with missing energy anyway. Uh, so essentially when a tau decays this way, it's indistinguishable. In Um, from prompt leptons. That is, if we had produced a muon instead of a tau originally, we can't really tell that apart experimentally from a tau that decays to a muon, at least at the LHC. Um, I mean, this is 30, maybe it's, I think it's closer to 36%. So uh, roughly a third of the time, we can't ever tell that there's a tau on there. Um, so other ways taus decay, so it always decays through a W, but this can also decay to, say, u d bar, right? Um, in fact, if the tau is on shell, this is the only way the w can decay. Uh, so what is this? If this forms a bound state, this is a pion. So we can have tau to pi plus neutrino. That's one possible decay. This happens 10% of the time. Uh, we can have tau to a rho. So the rho meson is a, a vector meson, 770 MeV. Um, you know, so it's a different bound state of u d bar. Uh, with, with angular momentum, and a neutrino, and then the rho itself is unstable and will decay to a pi zero, pi plus neutrino, and so we get this decays to gamma gamma pi plus neutrino. Uh, so what we get here are uh, tau I lose something. Yeah. So, so here and here the signature is mostly a pion. We also get photons, uh, but we get one charged track, right? So these are called one-prong decays. Uh, and that happens around, uh, I don't know, 50% of the time. So 50% of the time, the signature of a pion is a single charged track associated with the pion. I mean, the, a tau looks like a pion uh, and some missing energy and some photons. Uh, but, but, you know, having only one pion is not that common, right? So remember, this is a lepton, so it's not colored, right? So if there was something, for example, a Z decaying to tau tau, and Z is also not colored, so you might not expect much hadronic radiation, and if all you see is a single pion there, right, that probably didn't come from a gluon, it probably came from a tau. Because otherwise, if it came from a gluon, there would be, you know, 500 pions, right? So seeing low multiplicity pions is a signature of taus. Um, the other way tau can decay is to, uh, say, the A meson, which decays then to pi plus, pi minus, pi plus, and neutrino. So you might have three charged pions. Um, this is called a three-prong decay. And happens 14% of the time. Uh, so that's basically how it works. So you get some 30% of the time you get a, a single lepton, uh, which isn't to say that, that it's not interesting. It's just that you don't know it's a tau on. Sometimes you don't care. Sometimes you're just looking for leptons. Um, and so in fact, when I look at you know z to mu mu, right? When we talk about the branch ratio to z to mu mu, it's actually slightly larger than z to e plus e minus because when z goes to tau tau and the tau goes to mu, we include that in the z to mu mu rate, right? So instead of you know three percent, it's you know four percent, something like that. Uh, otherwise, they're one prong and three prong decays, which are signatures of taus. Any questions about taus? No. Uh, well, it's, you, the met is a global thing, so you need to put the tau in the context of what you're actually uh, measuring. But, but I don't think. I mean, whenever you have a muon, you always have a lepton. I mean, usually, so it's hard to. I mean, a neutrino. So you'll get MET anyway. I mean, it depends on the particular analysis. But MET is almost always fold in to advance when you're looking for TAUs. You include MET in some part of the, the signature. But, um, but it's not local, right? If you have a TAU going somewhere, it's much easier to look for a pion or three pions. Right? So the three prong decay is looking for three charged tracks. It's also something only three is a signature that it was a TAU on and not a QCD jet. Uh, OK. So finally, let's talk about the Higgs boson. And you guys have already heard a lot about the Higgs boson. 
So uh, I'm just going to review some of what Sally said and put it in kind of a collider context. And then we'll look at some pictures. OK. Um, so the Higgs boson. The mass of the Higgs is around 125 GeV. Um, let me do its decay modes as a pie chart, which I think helps emphasize the. Why do I draw it up there? I don't know. So uh, it can decay to. Um, So it, right here. so it can decay to ZZ star, which it does about, which then goes to um, say three percent of the time. Uh, it decays to WW star, twenty-one percent of the time. Tau tau, six percent of the time. Uh, glue glue, nine percent and BB bar 60%. So of this pie chart, let me draw the B as the biggest one. I'll draw it on top because I don't have any room to write. Uh, so 60% is, let me draw 60%. It's more than half. So this is BB bar, 60%. Uh, WW is 20%. Blue glue is 9%. Uh, Taus are six percent. ZZ is a little bit, and I kind of my circle didn't close. Let me erase that line. Uh, anyway, mostly to B is a little bit something to W, a little bit of Zs, and if you want the Zs to the K of to leptons, you get even fewer of them. Uh, again, as Sally mentioned, the ZZ star is the nicest channel because you can do because you can fully reconstruct the event. Oh, there's also gamma gamma, gamma gamma which is 10 to the minus 3, or a 0.1%, maybe 10 to the minus 2. Uh, so you get very few events going to photon, photon. You get 3% to ZZ, but if you also want the Zs to decay to electrons or muons, you're paying large branching ratios that way too. So you're also down to the you know, sub-percent level for ZZ star. Um, but the nice thing about gamma, gamma, and ZZ star is that you can fully reconstruct everything. Right? If the Z decays to muons, you see, say, two muons, two electrons. You reconstruct one of the Zs. One of the Zs is off-shell, so you don't completely reproduce it. But you add the invariant mass of all four leptons, and you get the Higgs. Not only that, but with the ZZ star, because you have four, you can look at the angle of the muons, say, with respect to the electrons. And you can measure the spin of the Higgs from the relative angles of those. Well, for photons, you just get two photons, so there's not really an angle. Um, to measure the Higgs. So ZZ star is called the golden channel because it's very clean because you reconstruct the Z and you have four leptons and the leptons are, are very well measured, but also because you can study properties of the Higgs that you can't study with other modes and you can do things like measure the Higgs width from looking at the um, uh, looking at the invariant mass distribution away from the, the Higgs region. Uh, so well, the other things you have to know about the Higgs are the way you produce it um, so, well, Sally just talked about all this stuff, so let me just draw the diagrams again. There's gluon fusion. Uh, which is uh, 43 picobarns. We have uh, uh, associated production. This is around one picobarn. So this is uh, associated production is a Z and a Higgs. Sometimes this is called Higgs Strahlung because the Higgs is kind of like Bremsstrahlung off of a Z. Uh, you also have W. Higgs. Um, what else do you have? Uh, I think each of these separately are one picobarn. And we have, uh, of course, vector boson fusion. So vector boson fusion, we have incoming, say, an up quark that turns into a down and has a W. 
And then the W's interact, so this would be uh, WW, and the W's might produce a Higgs from the Higgs WW interaction. Uh, and you would think this might be uh, small, but actually the cross-section is around four picobarns. Um, well, there's other associated production channels. There's TT bar. So TT bar can... Uh, so these are weak interactions, so they only interact with quarks. The nice thing about TT bar is you can have a gluon initiated state. So I could have TT bar. And then the Higgs couples strongly to the top. So this interaction, you don't pay any suppression for this, so you get enhancements, even though the top is higher, so there's a higher threshold for this. That is, the invariant mass of the collision, S hat, needs to be 2MT plus M Higgs, right, which is 500 GV or something. Uh, however, because you get the gluon PDFs, which are larger, because the proton is mostly gluons, um, and you have an order one coupling, um, while here you have weak couplings, this ends up being, you know, pretty substantial. So this is, and it grows very fast with energy, so this is real five... Picobarns. Um, you can also have associated production with bees, which is also half a picobarn. So that's a similar process. BB bar. So now you don't have to have be at such high invariant mass. This is also uh, 0 0.5 picobarns. So basically, we get most of its gluon fusion, uh, but these other things have extra handles. Gluon fusion, the problem is you just get the Higgs, right? So for example, if you were looking for Higgs to BB bar, you would never be able to see it in this channel because you just have glue glue to BB bar, which is a factor of 10,000 times bigger, right? Um, so if you want to look for something like Higgs to BB bar, it's helpful to look at something like an associated production channel, which has you know, a factor of 40 less cross-section, but you have this nice tag from the Z. I mean, of course, if the Z goes to leptons, it's 3%, so you're hurting there, um, but you have much less background, right? So it would be BB bar plus a Z, which there's some cross-section for that, but maybe it's manageable. Also, the kinematics of this are different from the kinematics of Z BB bar. Um, TT bar also, well, okay, it's the cross-section. It's actually not that small. And if you could tag both tops, and there's methods to do that. I mean, a top is a very characteristic object. It decays to a B and a W, so you have a lepton. If you do semi-leptonic top decays, you have a hadronic top over here and a semi-leptonic there. You have 40% of the branching ratio. You can tag the Higgs, so you can see more, more exotic decays of a Higgs that way. Right? For example, a Higgs to missing energy or something in an all-hadronic top channel is something people are looking at. Um, Vector boson fusion uh, is a very nice channel because, uh, for example, it's sensitive to longitudinal couplings of the Higgs, so you measure different kinds of things. You can also measure the Higgs cubic interaction here. Um, a really nice thing about vector boson fusion, so I should say this, uh, uh, because it takes quarks inside the jet, those quarks are often at, so here we would want uh, one, so we want this to be W plus and this W minus. So this might be up, and W minus we want uh, a down. Uh, so this might be D, oh, sorry, I can't even read it. So we might have up, down here, and then this would be down, up, there, um, which would produce uh, up and minus, right? So then we would have uh, two valence quarks here. So you actually get a large cross-section, but then you have X close to one, and so big differences in X um, can make a big difference. So so these this ends up being very, very boosted. So you end up with uh, the what this actually looks like are the protons come in, and because of the structure of the PDFs, the up and the down. So, so the final state is this is this jet over here from the up, the jet from the down, and then the Higgs decay. So you might have the Higgs somewhere in the middle, um, but then you always get these forward jets from the D because this is a T-channel process. So it's basically it has a singularity at T equals zero. So you get that this happens in the very forward region, and this other one happens in the forward region. So you get a Higgs somewhere in the middle and two jets going forward. But an interesting thing about this process is the things that interact with the Higgs are color neutral, right? So you get all the colored stuff going this way and colored stuff going that way, and you don't expect any colored stuff in the central rapidity region, right? That's called a rapidity gap. I don't know if you guys can read this down here. So that means uh, no QCD radiation. in, you know, say, eta less than 2. And when, by no, we don't mean no, because there's also an underlying event and pile up and so on, but not, not a lot. Right? You expect a, an absence of it. Compared to, say, a background for this, um, which might be just producing two forward jets from QCD and some central stuff. Right? Uh, for example, uh, one channel they use this for is to look for Higgs to tau tau. Right? So if the Higgs decays to tau tau, 
right? The taus are leptons, right? And the branching ratio of Higgs to tau tau is 6%, right? Uh, they're leptons, but they decay hadronically, but they decay to these one-prong or two-prong decays. So in this kind of process, you might see two forward jets and a couple of pions in the middle, a couple of hard pions, right? And then a couple of hard pions that might reconstruct something close to the Higgs mass. But you wouldn't see a lot of QCD radiation. On the other hand, the background for this, which is producing some pions and some jets, right, would be processes like, you know, gluons come in and a gluon goes out and you have more gluons, extra gluons, radiation. There, you just have gluons everywhere. And so there's no reason to expect only a few pions in the middle. Right, so this rapidity gap is useful in these leptonic channels because this is not colored and this isn't colored and this isn't colored. So you see very low multiplicity. So the rapidity gap is one of the, the signatures of vector boson fusion with a leptonic a Higgs decay or Higgs to ZZ or something like that. Right? If you do Higgs to BB bar, it's not less useful because then the BB bar jets are just a bunch of QCD radiation and the, you lose the rapidity gap because you're getting back in QCD. Um, so vector boson fusion is one of the, the channels that's great for Higgs to tau tau. Um, you can also do Higgs to tau tau in a lot of these other associated production channels. You can't really do it in gluon fusion because, again, these are gluons, so you have more radiation, and then these taus look like pions, but you can't tell those pions from any other pions. Uh, so it's very hard to do tau tau with gluon fusion. Uh, right. Uh, so, okay, good. So let's look at some pictures. So again, I want to just remind you how uh, the detector works. Uh, remember, there's this the inner detector where you measure tracks. Uh, then there's electromagnetic calorimeter and, and photons. So this, this thing shows how a, the various things we measure, which are photons, electrons, muons, protons, neutrons, or pions. Think of a pion like a proton um, and neutrinos. So again, a photon electron show up mostly here. Uh, the proton, uh, well, what's going on here? This, this whole thing is the inner detector. This is the eCal. So you see the, the, in this cartoon, the electron and the photon use all their energy in the electromagnetic calorimeter. The proton and the neutron get through. The neutron doesn't leave a track. The neutrino gets all the way through, and the muon gets out into the, to the muon system at the edge. Um, yeah, so the lambda b would be decaying down here in the, in the tracker, right? And so you would see it as a displaced vertex. I mean, this is kind of a funny cartoon of it. I don't know, the beam's coming in this way, right? It might go off this way and then decay. And you would see that displaced vertex and the tracks point back for the lambda b, right? Uh, no, I think it's the same order, you know, a couple of hundred microns. Um, uh, maybe it's on the, you know, 500 micron level versus 400 micron, but but they can certainly see lambda bees. Okay. What? Uh, no, I don't think it's the scale. Uh, I can show you some pictures of Atlas, and we can figure it out. Um, okay. So what's this? This is the quiz part of the uh, of the lecture. So I'll walk you through some of the first ones. So what do we see here? This is, this is a nice one because they've told you what everything is. So we get two B-tag jets. They tell you the PT. There's this uh, missing energy. So these, uh, let me get my pointer. You know what, maybe I'll put some more screens down. Uh, everyone can look at these. Uh, yeah, so this one we have. Uh, this arrow here is missing energy, so of course you don't record missing energy, but they reconstruct it, missing transverse energy, and they tell you the size of it. They also tell you the azimuthal angle. So we have two B jets. We have um, a muon, and they tell you it's BT, and another muon. So this is a plus muon, and that's a minus muon, and they tell you the dimuon invariant mass. So can anyone tell me what this event is? TT bar. Why do you think it's TT bar? Uh, I'm sorry, I was playing with the lights. Say that again. That's right. So that's exactly what you'd expect from TT bar. Um, you'd expect two Bs from the top decaying to BW, and then the W decays, one of the Ws decays to a plus muon, and one decays to a minus muon. Um, so in that case, the dimuon mass, so why is the dimuon mass interesting? It's not large. It's not large? It's not like, uh, it's equal. Exactly. So it rules out a background, which is a z to mu plus mu minus. OK, great. This thing's still, oh, we got another one. One more. Oh, what's this? 
So we have one B tag jet, one jet that doesn't have a B tag, um, an electron, a muon, and a dilepton mass of uh, 90 GeV. What did you say? Single top. Why single top? No, we take it back. Associated production of what? With what? Of a Z and what? What? You have to speak up. I, I can't hear you. A Z with a B? A Z with a Higgs. What, what does the Higgs decay do? Yeah, that's great. So that's that's what this is. This is TT bar. There's some misleading clues here. Um, you, you might think that the dilepton mass of 90 GeV means there's a Z. How do you know that's not right? Right, because it's an electron and a muon. A Z can't decay to an electron and a muon in the standard model. So uh, that looks close to the Z, but it's not a Z. Um, yeah, so this is just TT bar. It's just like the other one, um, except we mistagged one of the B jets, or we didn't tag it correctly as a B, um, and that happens a fair amount of the time anyway. Uh, okay, what about this? So the next one's I'm not going to label anything. Yeah, so it's not quite die jets. You can see, so what these, the size of these histograms mean the energy deposit in that region of the calorimeter. If it was die jets, you would expect one peak and basically a die off away from the central peak. That's right. This is a TT bar event um, at high energy. So this would be like a, a 2 TeV thing decaying to BB bar. One top goes this way, one top goes that way. Um, this one is a hadronic top decay, which goes to three jets. Um, and this is a semi-leptonic top decay, which goes to a jet here. And this would be an electron that shows up um, as some penetration through the H-cal, which you see here. What? <laughs> well, I'm just getting started. OK, what's this one? <laughs> what? Someone said top? Well, you tell me. What, is, what do you think the red thing is? What? Well, if it was dark matter, if it was missing energy, we wouldn't have two red things. <laughs> what? Unless it was a simulation. What? what, what? Muons. Muons, right. So they keep going off, off the page, just like muons do. Right? Um, a, a green is often electrons. Uh, and you can kind of see that here. I mean, it, it depends on what's... You know, basically, the size of this energy deposit tells you what's going on. And they distinguish. Usually, bluish energy deposits are E-cals, and yellowish are H-cals. So you get a little bit of energy, but mostly it's, um, uh, uh, mostly it's ener electromagnetic energy. So what do you think it is? ZZ with what? Two E's and two mu's, OK. Right. Yeah, so, so it's close, but it's actually, uh, this is a Higgs decay uh, to ZZ star, which goes directly to the Z. So they don't tell you what you reconstruct here, but you might check that if you could reconstruct the Z here and here. Um, in fact, one of the Z's would be off shell, and this is Higgs to ZZ star, and one Z goes to E plus E minus, and one Z goes to mu plus mu minus. Why so many that Yeah, it's just stuff going on in the detector, right? I mean, yeah. And not pile up, it's probably underlying event. It's probably just other, other interactions of the same protons that collided. Uh, yeah, I mean, right, ISR, just other things related to the collision. I mean, every, you know, as we said, you get hundreds of tracks, you get 100 pile up events. All of this is here, and you can't tell one thing from another, especially if you look just down the beam line like this. Okay, how about this one? It's not the same. It's what? Two electrons and two pions. Where do you see pions? So what are these green things? What? So this green thing is the electromagnetic calorimeter, and this red thing is the hadronic calorimeter. And the size of the lines tell you the energy deposited in each section. Um, and these are the tracks, and they try to match back the tracks to the deposit. 
So what are these green things? How do you know they're not photons? Because there's tracks, and they match them up to tracks, and that's why you can tell an electron from photon. So what is this event? Tell me where's the missing energy? You're saying it's missing energy because you're adding everything up? Yeah, you have to be really careful doing that. Uh, um, because you can't see how much is going here, right? So all you can do is add up the missing en the energy of the electrons. So this is four electrons, right? You can't quite see their charges, but what do you think this is? Yeah, this is another Higgs. This is Higgs to two Zs, which go to four electrons. Why are there two? Oh, they're not going there. That's just size of the histogram here. That's just how they draw it. The electron kind of gets sucked up over here. I think the red tells you where the energy is actually deposited. Yeah, so it's a little, you have to get used to looking at these. All right, let's do this one. What? Diphotons. Why do you say diphotons? So, there's, so right here we see the deposit, and here we see there's no track that it matches up to. So if there's an electron, we should see a track, and this one also. Do you see a track? Well, it's a little hard to tell, but maybe not. So what do you think this is? Higgs to gamma gamma, right? And you can see here that there's really a lot of energy in these photons, right? This is the Lego plot version of this, and this shows you a different view, which shows you that this one went off that way, and that one... But that way, so actually, they're back-to-back -back in azimuth, but as you can see, there's some boost to the event, longitudinal boost, so they're not back-to-back -back in polar angle. <laughs> this is 125 GeV. Uh, it's 2011. A lot of these are 2011. I don't know, they only make certain events. Okay, what's this one? So what's this over there? Is it a pion? Is it a muon? What is it? Photon or electron? Do you think it's a so why is it a first of all, why is it a photon or an electron? Because it's all it gets all its energy in the green part. It doesn't get anything in the hadronic calorimeter. So it's not a, a proton or a neutron. Um, okay, so that's is that electron or a photon now? Photon. How do you know? Okay, what about this one? Electron. So this looks like a photon electron. Right here you can see this matches onto that track. So what do you think this is? W decay to a photon electron? Well, I mean... Uh, and you can see they're also sort of back-to-back -back in the same sort of angles that the previous one was. W gamma production. Maybe, but that's not what this is. Uh, maybe a hint. It's another Higgs. It's another Higgs event. Higgs to e gamma. <laughs> Let me. Uh, so what we do next is we'll just zoom in on this region of of the plot. So I'm going to zoom in over here where this uh, photon was, and here's actually where the deposits are of the energy. So this is this electron on this side, right? So here's the, the track that matches up to that deposit. Um, but you can see by looking at details of the, of the detector, there's also this other track. And you can actually see the curvature of the track. Right? So what happened here? No, it's not Z gamma. That, well, it's not faking like so it's converting. So what it is is a photon that, that converts into an E plus E minus pair from interaction with the detector. It's a very energetic thing, so there's some probability that it turns into an electron-positron pair. Um, and that happens not uncommonly. So you can't immediately identify this as an electron. I mean, it is an electron, but really what happened is over here somewhere, the interaction in the tractor, the photon converted to an E plus E minus pair. Right? So really, it's just Higgs to gamma gamma, but one of the gammas looks like an electron until you look more closely, and then it's really an electron-positron pair. Um, okay, how about this one? Vector boson fusion. Why do you say vector boson fusion? What? Yeah, there's forward jet. So this thing, this coney thing, is a forward jet. That's what it looks like. One goes off this way, one goes off that way. 
What else do we have? Muon, what's the muon? The red thing. So there's a muon. It goes all the way off, all the way off. Um, and this dashed blue line tells you the missing energy. And what's the green thing? Electron. So you're figuring out the color code here. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I mean, I don't know. Photons are distinguished. Okay. So what do you think this is? Uh, close. What? Not ZZ star. It's not WW star. Tau tau. That's exactly right. And what happens to the taus? Yeah, this one decays to a muon, that decays to a lepton. I mean an electron, right? So this happens some percent of the time. The tau decays to a muon, the other tau decays to an electron. And those are the easiest ones to see, actually. You don't have to worry about that pion nonsense. Um, you can sort of see the rapidity gap that there's not that much radiation here, but maybe it's hard to see. Um, yeah, so this is a Higgs to tau tau candidate event uh, where you can't really reconstruct the Higgs mass because of the missing energy, but you can try. Uh, Um, um, yeah, so, you, you, I guess you can't from just looking at it, but you can from the analysis by looking at the kinematics of the lepton and the, and the muon. Um, uh, well, um, I, well, I, I mean, you can't tell that the W was longitudinal. Uh, I mean, I think the, the energy of the leptons is characteristic of the tau decay. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, and well, the invariant mass of the tau should we reconstruct them. Yeah. Right, but you can't completely reconstruct them because there's two neutrinos from every tau decay. Uh, and there's two tau decays here, so you have four neutrinos. You have the overall missing energy, and you get the transverse momentum of that, but you can't really split it up. So you can look at things like the transverse mass of the event and so on to help distinguish it from WW. Um, but um, yeah, I think also the cross-section is smaller for WW than tau tau uh, in vector boson fusion with leptonic decays. And so if you just put in the rates, you don't really expect many events early on. Uh, but you can fold that in. I don't know. I mean, you probably shouldn't if you're trying to measure it, but you know, it can bias your results. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? OK, what's this one? Now here's some WWs. Why, why, why WW? So you say these are these are jets or, or over there from a W decay, and then you say this is a muon and that's a neutrino from the other W, right? Yeah, yeah, very good. That's what it is. It's a WW. <laughs> well, I was trying to think if I could say something more interesting, but. But yeah, it's, it's uh, a semi-leptonic WW event. Uh, let's see, do I have any more? This one is, oh yeah, here's some with B, I put in some more information. Here's two Bs with an invariant mass of 122. Uh, and they give you these two, well, I guess now you know by now that they're electrons. Um, what do you think this is? That's exactly what it is, yeah. So it takes to BB bar over here associated with the Z. So this is one of the events that we've seen that, you know, this is one of the... Higgs to BB bar hasn't been well measured, but the few events that we have look kind of like this. So, um... Well, you could reconstruct the Higgs. Yeah, so here you can fully reconstruct the event, take the invariant mass of all four things, and you should get something close to the Higgs. But of course there's interference and they're not well-defined separation. Um, how about this one? Oops. <laughs> so what do we see? We see a lot of energy going this way in the detector and not much going this way. Dark matter. <laughs> what? ZZ? Why ZZ?
It goes to what? Right, but there isn't really missing energy in this event. I mean, there's the recoiling it, but actually it's a bunch of soft stuff that compensates the energy deposit. So this is a, this is a heavy ion collision. And what's going on, this is, you, you knew that. <laughs> this is an example of what's called jet quenching, where a jet, the quarks are, the jets are produced inside the nucleus, so like a lead atom, and then, but near the edge. So one of the jets has to go all the way through the whole lead nucleus, and by the time it gets to the end, it doesn't have much jet left. It interacts and kind of diffuses. But the other one, because it's going right near the edge, gets out. So this is the one that gets out, and the other one you don't get out. So this is a characteristic phenomenon called jet quenching that you see at heavy ion collisions. Well, it's an interpretation of it. I'm, I'm just saying this is a heavy ion event. Um, but uh, there's ways to calculate it. I mean, they're not great. But the, the story is pretty straightforward. Right, so it's just you know, a asymmetric deposit of energy. Sometimes you'll have a jet and a photon or something like that you can use to determine things. Um, what did I... Uh, I wanted to make one other point. Well, I guess I'm done, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop. Okay, we'll stop here. Gosh, for sure. Um, Ben? What's your name? Uh, Keith. Oh, good. Yeah. I didn't get to do anything I anything in QFT, too, but... I thought it would be way too nerdy if I asked you to sign my copy. Oh. It's okay. We're all nerds. Do you have, uh, do you have Yeah, sure. Well, when you, when you talked about the Tau stuff, yeah. um, I know there are some work going on for the Tau tagging.